Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. A little more than two years after the disappearance of Cecilia Huertas Gallegos, an arrest has been made in the case. Her husband, Reyes Gallegos, now charged with her murder. Our Jeffany Gray is at police headquarters this evening where officers gave details in this case. She joins us live now with what she was able to find out. So, Jeffany, did the suspect say anything as he was being walked out there by police? Myra, he did. Now, Reyes Gallegos was pretty adamant about being innocent. Even after I asked him multiple times, like, hey, you're in handcuffs for a reason. Are you sure? He continued to say, I'm innocent. However, San Antonio police say there is enough evidence to prove otherwise. Now, here's a recap of everything we know so far about this case. Cecilia Huertas Gallegos was last seen July 7, 2019, on home surveillance video entering her home on Southwick Road, but she was never seen leaving. Police say Reyes was later arrested for filing a false police report the next day for saying they got into a fight and she left after she pulled a knife and cut him. Investigators reviewed surveillance video at the home and it showed that Huerta, Huertas was last seen the night of July 7th in the couple's bedroom. They said video also showed Gallegos with a chainsaw and cleaning supplies the next day. Since that day, several search and rescue groups as well as detectives have searched for Cecilia with hopes of reuniting her with her children and family. However, that day will never happen. When asked if a body had been found, police said in part, it was one of those portions of details we are not able to give much conclusiveness to. But they did say they had enough evidence to arrest Gallegos for murder. With her disappearance, um, with evidence as part of the case, I don't want to compromise that. Um, that led us to believe that um, an arrest with him being a primary actor and suspect um, was affected and that was accomplished today. Now, police did offer their condolences to the family in hopes that this will give them some sort of closure. Again, Reyes was booked for murder. Now, San Antonio police did not release specific details about the case because they say it's still under investigation. Live at Public Safety Headquarters, Jeffany Gray, KSAT 12 News. All right, more information to follow there. Thank you, Jaffany. Bear County commissioners are considering a massive $2.8 billion budget for the next fiscal year. That's roughly a billion more than last year. County staff says that's due to new infrastructure programs and a flood of federal dollars from the American Rescue Plan Act. And the county plans to leave the property tax rate at the same level. Part of the budget includes pay raises for employees and some elected officials. But as Garrett Berger tells us, not all of them plan to take that. After pandemic budgeting measures left their pay frozen this year, Bear County employees could see a 5% bump under next year's budget proposal. It's really been two years since most employees will have seen a pay increase. Um, this recognizes that the last 12 months, the national inflation rate has been 5% as calculated by the federal government. Hourly County employees would also get a $1,000 lump sum under the proposed budget. Though District 1's Rebecca Clay Flores wanted to see if they could push that up a bit more. I don't have a specific number in mind, but if we can work together to see if we can add um, a little bit more instead of just $1,000 for our hourly level workers. Eligible elected officials would also get a 5% raise in the proposed budget. That includes constables, the DA, and the commissioners themselves. County and district court judges are not included. And staff are proposing one justice of the peace actually has their pay cut in half to reflect a new part-time status. County commissioners have already started the ball rolling on the raises, but each official will have the opportunity to decline it something Precinct 3's Trish DeBerry says she would do. I'm okay with 5% across the board for essential workers and county employees because a lot of them have been coming in and doing work during the pandemic. I just don't think it's the appropriate time considering the salaries that elected officials make and those in seats of power make, including myself. Now is not the time for an increase. Sheriff Javier Salazar has said he too plans to decline the raise. Commissioners are expected to approve the budget on September 14th. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Governor Greg Abbott and Attorney General Ken Paxton trying again to undo the injunction, have it lifted, which allows masks to be required in Bear County schools. That injunction granted last week prevents the enforcement of the governor's executive order, which bans any government entity, including schools, 
from requiring face coverings. State, state officials were unsuccessful in their initial appeal last Thursday, so now they're turning to the Texas Supreme Court for a ruling. If successful this time, that would likely put an end to local efforts to undo Abbott's executive order, though that order is still being challenged in other parts of the state as well. Meantime, we are seeing a rise in COVID cases in some local schools. A spokesperson for Bernie ISD says as of last Friday, the district had 93 positive COVID cases. Erica Sines has two children that attend Herf Elementary School and her family now quarantining after a positive COVID case was reported in her son's class. Other parents finding themselves in similar situations. Masks are still optional in the district and some are asking for a change. As a parent, you want to know that they're going into a safe environment and learning. We were in this district last year when kids went back in person. My kids went back in person and they wore masks every day. And my children did not get COVID last year. We reached out to some other districts to find out what their plans are if major COVID outbreaks happen. You can find those details on our website right now at ksat.com. A former Bear County deputy now indicted for allegedly assaulting an inmate, 42-year-old Jaime Soto, charged with official oppression. Investigators say he used unnecessary force on an inmate back in December, knocking him to the ground for no reason. In June, Internal Affairs recommended he be fired. Soto resigned a few days later. San Antonio police trying to sort out what happened outside a strip club on the city's north side early this morning. A man ended up in the hospital with a gunshot wound. This happened around 2 a.m. at Sugars along Loop 410. According to police, a man saw three guys roughhousing in the parking lot there. Then shots were fired. One man was hit in the shoulder. He's expected to be okay. The others took off, but officers did catch up to them. With the Taliban unwilling to extend the August 31st deadline, one of the biggest airlifts in history has only seven days left. After processing and vetting abroad, a senior administration official says about 25,000 Afghan refugees will go to four military installations here in the U.S., including Fort Bliss. But so far, none in San Antonio, at least not yet. Jesse DeGoyado says even so, Afghan refugees are expected to join others who are already here. The faces of these Afghan refugees glow with joy and relief, waiting for their evacuation flights. Eventually, they may be among those coming to Fort Bliss. Resettlement agencies there will help the refugees decide where they want to go next. Having helped hundreds of Afghans since 2015, when they started coming to the Center for Refugee Services, its director is expecting another influx over the next few weeks. It could be as many as 400. It could be as few as 100. She says many of them were American allies in the war and their families escaping the Taliban. But these are folks that will be permanent residents in our city, and we want them to understand that they are welcome here. She says the center's website in the next day or so will have information for those wanting to help the new arrivals. All we can do on our end is be ready for people when they show up. Having worked for a U.S. agency, this man filling out paperwork is trying to get his family out of Afghanistan. Because they are really worried about it and they are really in serious situation. As soon as possible, please. Thank you. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look at the roads out there during this six o'clock commute. This is the trans guide camera here at Loop 410 and Broadway. You can see things in both directions. They're down on the main lanes of Broadway or on main lanes of 410 rather and the access roads smooth sailing. No real trouble spots to make you aware of. Another look outside this one from Sky 12 flying high above downtown this evening. 95 degrees out there. And is it me or it seems like the humidity has crept up a little bit? Oh, yeah, we're feeling that mugginess out All there right. today. That's for sure. And uh, this is pretty typical for August. So it's what we'd expect this time of year. But you definitely notice it and just some fair weather clouds popping up. You can see there off in the distance and today Another day under 100. We're seeing how long we can keep the streak going. And today our high temperature was 97, so that's two degrees above average. The record high, 103, set back in 2010. And our morning low, by the way, 78, four degrees above average. Taking a look at high temperatures elsewhere. Del Rio, 
Max out at 102 along with Catula, Laredo 101. As usual, those were the hot spots. Carrizal Springs 99 and 98 for the high in Pleasanton. You look outside right now and we're pretty close to our maximum temperatures for the day. Del Rio still at 101. 94 now in San Antonio, 90 in Rock Springs and Kerrville, you're at 93 degrees. So you look at the readings and it's what you'd expect this time of day for mid to late August. Even 97 in Stinson and Bulverde, 91 degrees. We have a few isolated showers out there far east of San Antonio. We're talking east of Hallettsville in Lavaca County and a few over the past couple of hours that have moved from Carnes County into Wilson County. These are already showing signs of falling apart. So unfortunately, we're not going to tally up much from these. We'll have a similar pattern as we get into tomorrow. But by Thursday, I think we'll see a few more of those pop up showers. Better odds. Just don't get your hopes too high. Mostly clear this evening and tonight. Southeasterly wind at 5 to 10 temperatures in the 80s. Tomorrow, 77 to start the day and then 97 by the afternoon. It's more of the same tomorrow on a CPS peak energy demand day. Try to lower your usage from 2 to 7 p.m. Tropics update straight ahead. We are just seconds away now from the city county briefing on COVID-19 cases in our area now happening on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We know last week at the end of the week there was some good news. The positivity rate in our community had declined, but the number of hospitalizations, that's the number that keeps increasing. People being seriously ill enough to have to seek out care in a hospital, stressing our system that is already uh, in a capacity crisis. Let's go now live to City Hall where we see the mayor and the county judge for the latest numbers. Director Claude Jacob, along with City Attorney Andy Segovia, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Uh, first of all, let's take a look at our progress and warning indicators as we've been dealing with the Delta surge in our community like everyone else has. This week, uh, thankfully, the positivity rate has dropped a bit to 13.6%. There's more testing occurring in our community, which is a good thing. And our, however, our case rate continues to go up. That has increased to 69.1 per 100,000 residents. That's a 36.2% increase from last, Saturday, last Sunday. Uh, and as noted, with more testing, we are finding those infections faster. So uh, we keep all those things in balance. These factors combined with the higher stress score in our hospital system and the other indicators we're keeping a watch on in the region uh, means that we're continuing to be in the severe risk category. As far as cases go, today, today we're reporting 1,254 new cases of COVID-19. Our seven-day moving average has dropped slightly from last time we reported it. It's now 1,174 cases per, seven, uh, per day. Uh, seven day average. We are unfortunately reporting five new deaths this evening. Um, and that means we have now lost 3,772 friends, neighbors, and loved ones to this virus. And we ask them, ask you to please continue to keep them and their families in your prayers this evening. Over in our hospitals, uh, there are 1,418 patients in area hospitals. There were 140 new admissions in the last 24 hours. If you've been keeping track of that, that is down slightly uh, from last week when we were at up near 200 nearly every day. Uh, so we will continue to watch that. 407 people are in the ICU and 245 are on ventilators. Uh, as noted, 85% of patients in the area, nearly 9 out of 10 in hospitals are unvaccinated. 24 patients are children. We do have a new epidemiological report to show to you this evening. You can find it on the covid19.sanantonio.gov website. We know that July has been a challenging month for our community, especially for our frontline workers, frontline healthcare workers especially. In July, Bear County reported 15,183 new cases of COVID-19 and 35 deaths, which are a trailing indicator. All of, almost all of that can be attributed to our Delta surge. Hospitalizations increased throughout July, a 385% increase from the end of June 2021 to the end of July 2021. And we know we are also facing challenges here uh, through August as well. This is something worth noting. 20 to 29 year olds made up the largest proportion of COVID-19 cases, followed by 30 to 39 year olds. In July, younger age groups also saw an increase in hospitalizations. And in fact, the average age of a hospital patient is 10 years younger than it was in our uh, January uh, fall surge. 
Remember, getting vaccinated and wearing a mask are your best defenses against this virus. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I think it's important for everybody to realize we're still in a very difficult time. When you look at the fact that our weekly moving average of cases per 10,000 went from 36 to 69, Yes, the positivity rate went down some. That's because we're testing more and they're beginning to test in school. So that percentage will go down, but the uh, the cases per 10,000 had, had a dramatic increase, almost not, well, not quite doubling, but close to doubling. Uh, we did, uh, we've done about 1,000 uh, infusions of Regeneron out at the uh, Bear County Expo Hall. And one day we hit as high as 100. We'd never been that high before. So people are taking advantage of going out, getting the Regeneron, and hopefully not getting any sicker because they tuck it and, and not being able and not end up in the hospital. And I think we're starting to see some impact of that. Our hospital numbers kind of go up one day, down one day, but they're still at a very, very dangerous uh, level over uh, 1,416, something like that. Uh, now, <clears throat> to give you a sense of why people that are uh, not vaccinated are much more dangerous. The CDD, CDC study showed you're 29 times, 29 times likely to be in the hospital if you are unvaccinated, 29 times. And then if you pass it on, you're five times more likely to get infected if you're not, if you're unvaccinated. So vaccinations are the key to the game. Uh, I think we got a really good positive step when the FDA gave final approval to Pfeiffer. Uh, that was one concern that people had, that they didn't want to get it till that happened. That has happened. We hope that you will go ahead and get it. Uh, the uh, Attorney General has uh, appealed our fourth court ruling. I'm not sure uh, when they will make a decision, but it is uh, apparently now in the, uh, in the Supreme Court. We are beginning to have a problem at the jail, and it's uh, caused by the state again. Uh, we have 86 people in the jail today that are positive, but what is dramatically causing our problem is overcrowding. We had a low of like 3,000 people in the jail at one time during the uh, pandemic. Uh, today we have 4,376. Why do we have so many? Well, 700 and some of them have been there long enough to be able to go in the prison system prison system hadn't been taken very, very few, so they're still stuck in our jail. Some of the rulings that the uh, uh, governor did to make it harder to give a, a PR bond to uh, misdemeanors has driven our jail population up. So they may have a problem in the prison with COVID, but what are they doing? They're shoving it right down to our level, putting our community in jeopardy. We've written a letter to the governor to state our problem I'm sure we won't hear anything positive about it, but we are at least bringing it to their attention. I think that's it for me. Thank you, Judge. Um, and as a reminder... All right, the county judge there talking about the issue of overcrowding uh, in the Bear County Jail. And let's start in terms of the COVID numbers with uh, the good news today. The positivity rate is down to 13.6%. For some perspective, it was over 16% last week. The hospitalization numbers, those are the numbers we continue to look at. 90% of people hospitalized. Nine out of 10 people are unvaccinated. The mayor also said that 24 children are hospitalized right now with COVID-19. We also got an indication as to the age of some of the people being most affected in our community. In the month of July, the 20 to 29 age group made up the largest proportion of cases uh, in Bear County in San Antonio and the mayor pointed out that is 10 years younger than the average age during that fall and winter surge. So something certainly to take note of there. Let's turn to the weather now. 94 degrees at this point. Adam Kasky, we know the heat is on. This is the time of year when we start to ask, OK, when are things going to change a little bit? When are they going to change? Does that mean when are we going to hit 100? Or I, that's not the change I'm hoping for. No, <laughs> right. it's actually it's the other direction. <laughs> okay, good. well we will we will be trimming off a few degrees in the days ahead. It's not going to be a drastic change, but it'll be in the right direction for some folks who want to see some uh, slightly lower temperatures even. Let's take a look at our radar right now. We have a few little showers that have popped up generally southeast of San Antonio, especially in Wilson County right now. That's where we have them lingering, but it's unlikely they're going to last much longer. They're already falling apart. And those of you east of Hallettsville, 
seen some of those taller, darker clouds. They're raining themselves out at the moment as well. So let's get an update on the tropics. This is the cluster of unorganized rain and thunderstorms that we're watching in the eastern Caribbean. This is going to be slowly be drifting westward, and it does have the potential to actually emerge into the Gulf of Mexico as we get into Sunday. Now this does have the likelihood of turning into next tropical depression, maybe even a tropical storm, slight chance of it becoming even a hurricane in that time frame. But once it potentially gets into the Gulf of Mexico, let's say on Sunday, at that point, if it happens, anything is possible. It's still too early to even speculate what could happen because nothing is even formed yet. And I know I wish we could have answers right now as well, but unfortunately, the science of meteorology just isn't there yet. If you don't have something to measure, like an organized storm that's spinning, it's hard to get any answers. So we may not even have answers to this upcoming weekend. So nothing to worry about right now. 77 tomorrow, 97 by the afternoon. Daily pop up isolated showers starting Thursday every afternoon into the weekend. All right. Thank you, Adam. Greg Simmons with sports up next. There is no question our San Antonio Spurs are in a rebuilding year. Ghana's leading scorer, DeMar DeRozan, in a sign-and-trade deal with the Chicago Bulls. Ghana's veteran, Patty Mills, was the last member of the 2014 championship team after signing with the Brooklyn Nets, and Rudy Gay is now in Utah. That means with no superstar on the court, the success of the silver and black will be left up to the young guns, such as 24-year-old starting point guard DeJounte Murray and defensive skills of Derek White if he can stay healthy. But with DeMar out of the picture, Lonnie Walker IV is looking to step up his game on both offense and defense, hoping to use his newfound minutes to share more the scoring load this season. But despite that, Vegas is not impressed. They have the Spurs winning only 29 games this season, missing the playoffs for the third straight season. Walker had a warning to those who are selling the Spurs short this season with this tweet he just put out. I heard all the disrespect. We acting different this season. After finishing fourth in the nation, the college football rankings, the Fighting Texas Aggies are picked to finish sixth, according to the Associated Press, this season in the preseason rankings. That's behind Alabama, Oklahoma, Clemson, Ohio State, and Georgia. Also, former Judson star DeMarvin Leal is one of three Aggie players, including Kingdon Green and running back Isaiah Spiller, who have been named to the Associated Press preseason All-America team. Jalen Jones is about to start his second season in Aggie Land. A safety moved to cornerback and was asked what is different about this season for him after what he had to go through last season as a freshman. The whole college process and things like that, you know, I came early back uh, last January, not this last January, but the January coming into 2020 came early, you know, just getting a feel for college and things like that and then COVID hit. So it was kind of just at home chilling and things like that. But coming back, you know, going to fall camp, starting the season up, you know, just getting the whole college atmosphere, you know, feeling, you know, just from high school, it's, it's totally different. And the Aggies kick off their season Saturday, September the 4th against Kent State at Kyle Field at 7 p.m. Here we go. The big game and a big game coverage this week is number one Brennan against number two Reagan at Ferris Stadium on Friday night. But the 2021 high school football season actually kicks off this Thursday with a big game that night. Brandeis against O'Connor at Ferris Stadium as well. And when the Broncos kick off their season, they'll do so with a new coach. Charles Bruce has made the move from Wagner to the Northside School District. Welcomes back 16 starters, eight each on offense and defense off a team that did not make the playoffs last year. And they're being moved to District 28-68 that contains mostly Northeast School District teams. They're hoping all around athlete here Aiden Inesta Rodriguez can help on both sides of the ball especially after the four-year starter was able to come up with 36 tackles and two interceptions to go along with his play a wide receiver and special teams as a kick returner for the counter Panthers head coach David Molesky is blessed with 10 starters returning five each on offense and defense of a team that also failed to make the playoffs last season in district 29 6a the Panthers will also rely on their defense this year led by defensive lineman Isaac Dodsey who had 38 tackles and four sacks last season Oh, this week is, is big. You know, we've known these kids growing up for years, and there's a lot of trash talk going back and forth. But at the end of the day, it's, it's fun being able to play this game. It's really special. You know, we, we didn't get to play last year because of COVID, so it's another break as it was like four years ago now. And it's a big rivalry. A lot of people show, a lot of people want to see us play, and we're just as excited. All right, kickoff between Brandeis and O'Connor set for 7 p.m. this Thursday at Ferris Stadium, and we will be there for all the highlights for you. Mm -hmm. It's a big week. It is. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Our KSAT Q&A is coming up next. You hear the numbers nearly every single day. You hear the pleas, the urging to get more people in our community vaccinated against COVID-19 so we can end this pandemic. 
but it's not often that we hear from the people who are doing the hard work of working on the front lines, trying to save lives. But we're doing that in today's KSAT Q&A with Allison Gebhardt, patient care coordinator in the neurosciences ICU at University Hospital. Allison, first off, a huge thank you, not only for being here, but for what you are doing right now. And I want to talk about what is happening right now, the real situation on the ground, if you will, in the hospital. And I know I mentioned you work in the neurosciences ICU. However, that ICU is caring for COVID-19 patients. Is that right? That is correct. So I work in a neurosciences ICU. I'm a nursing manager there. We're a 14 bed ICU that through these pandemic surges has actually expanded to care for COVID patients. So we've kept our census here in the ICU providing care for our stroke patients and expanded to care for COVID patients um, as the need in the community has increased. So we've expanded our 14 bed ICU to 30 beds currently, but then in the previous surge, we actually cared for up to 42 patients. Talk about what it's like right now for you and your colleagues in the hospital dealing with this latest surge. Can you walk us through a day? Absolutely. You know, it's it's difficult and uh, knowing that this third surge was coming for us, you know, we, we all took a, a, a deep breath because we knew the rigor and the intensity and the resources and the teamwork that comes with expanding our ICU and providing care for COVID patients, as well as our sick and stroke patients. So, you know, we just relied on our, our teamwork and each other um, to provide and expand um, as the community needed at this time. You know, we we support each other every day. We, we build each other up in the morning. We know that difficult times are coming. We know that there are gonna be unpredictable events during the day. You know, as we fought this third surge, um, what we've noticed is a difference between our patients previously and our patients now is we could really kind of predict when patients would be um, becoming a little bit more sick throughout the next 12 hours or 24 hours. But really here during this Delta surge, we're, we're seeing quite a change in our patients where in the morning patients might be very stable. And then by the afternoon with just in a few hours, we are, we are really moving in to be more progressive in their care where we're, we're proning or we're intubating patients very quickly um, to help um, improve and give them a chance to return home to their families. And that's something that I, I was curious about in terms of the, the previous surge you have worked through and this Delta variant. Does it seem like, I mean, you're, you're talking about how it seems like things progress faster uh, with cases right now. Are symptoms more severe? Have you noticed a difference in how patients are faring? You know, I think we've seen quite a difference, especially in our acute care unit, which is also expanded to provide care for COVID patients, um, where we're seeing patients who are, are, are sick here coming to the hospital, and actually I believe they're, they're a little bit more sick coming to the hospital that we're seeing in this Delta surge than previously. We're having patients on high flow um, nasal cannulas in our acute care unit that are sustaining there um, and quite a few more of those in our, in our acute care unit before they come to the ICU. So we, we are seeing patients that are a little bit more sick than we've seen in our previous um, surges, but then also know that there are patients at home that are also struggling as well. So um, just trying to, to do what we can do for the community. What are families or patients, if they're able to, what are they telling you about being hospitalized, about dealing with all of this? Any stories that stand out in your mind? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle because all of our patients are somebody's person. You know, these are these are people's wives and husbands and significant others and moms and dads. And I think especially with this surge, seeing a younger patient population where we're in their 30s and their 40s rather than in their 50s and 60s and a little bit closer to the age of us providing care for them. You know, it's, it's definitely alarming to see patients um, like this. You know, we're seeing different stories too, where family members who are un, who are vaccinated are, are seeing their unvaccinated family members in our hospital. And we're, we're helping with that conversation there over FaceTime um, due to the limited visitation in the hospital. And it's been, it's been a difficult balance, you know, where nursing is stepping in and we're part of these very private conversations um, because we're that link between 
family that can't be here in person um, and their family member. And so trying to fill that gap. And I think that's one of the things that's been really difficult, um, you know, and so we hear and we, we don't always see our patients their best, you know, when they're in the hospital and they're not feeling well, we don't get to see these vibrant people that we know that they are. And so, you know, it's been it's been difficult, but those family members have a, a little bit of regret when they they wish they would have had some of those conversations a little bit sooner or try to be um, a little bit more um, proactive in talking to their family member about becoming vaccinated um, prior to hospitalization. And, and that's what I want to end with. You know, when you are doing the, the hard work, you and your colleagues, of expanding your ICUs to make sure that you have the ability to care for the patients who are critically ill, when you hear talk about people not wanting to get the vaccine or wanting to wait longer or not wanting to wear masks, seeing the, the legal battles playing on out, you know, outside the hospital, what would your advice be uh, when it comes to those safety measures? What would you tell someone who is trying to make the right decision or trying to just decide what they think is best for their families. Absolutely. So, you know, I, we strongly encourage those who are able to become vaccinated to be vaccinated um, for their own personal health and for the community. If, if that doesn't fit your picture and it doesn't, um, it's not your choice, um, we strongly encourage you to wear a mask um, and to social distance and to just help keep the community safe. Allison, it's not lost on me how positive you seem uh, throughout all of this. So a huge thanks for all of us here to you and to your fellow nurses for the care that you all are providing. And of course, thanks for your time here this evening. Thank you for your support. We appreciate you. We'll be right back. NYC uh, and their public schools have, have mandated uh, that employees be vaccinated. That's not where we are as a school system as of yet. I'm sure that question was, was coming, so I want to go ahead and hit it head on and address it. No vaccine mandate for the largest school district in the state, which returned to class this week, at least not yet, you heard there. But there is a mask mandate for Houston ISD. The superintendent, Millard House, saying he is committed to keeping kids safe this school year with a mask requirement, which goes against Governor Greg Abbott's orders and the wishes of some parents. He says COVID-19 data is a reminder that we are in a public health crisis and that some Houston ISD students with medical conditions will be allowed to attend classes virtually. Another look outside with live cam this evening. No real clouds in this view. That shouldn't surprise anyone based on the temperatures. No real help with this heat, Adam. No, and you know, we're right near average for this time of year. We have yet to hit 100 degrees so far this year. It's still possible, but it doesn't look like we will in the foreseeable future. 94 at the moment will be 86 by 10 o'clock midnight in the lower 80s. And really the rain chances that we had out there east of town, those showers are coming to an end. More rain chances coming down the pike, along with an update on the tropics and what we're watching watching straight ahead. All right, let's get to the forecast now. I know Adam, you mentioned some rain chances, but I also know things are kind of quiet in the weather pattern when I hear the clanking of thermometers <laughs> over there in the yeah, that's the sound. We've got ornament season coming up. I need to be prepared. Ornament season. Christmas yes. is just around the corner when it comes to thermometers. OK, Not holiday season ornament, ornament. Se ornament season. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we call it now around here. You got to get prepared, got to get ready for it. And now's the time. So we'll be trimming off a few degrees from our temperatures in the days ahead. A few pop up showers returning every afternoon. That starts Thursday and we're watching the tropics for a little activity that could uh, be developing and heading toward the Gulf of Mexico. Let's start with the heat today across the state, mostly well into the 90s. You head farther to the north parts of Oklahoma, Kansas, well, they were above 100. Wichita made it to 101, but at Alpine 92, 94 in Lubbock, Junction 97 along with Dallas, and Del Rio and Laredo, Catula all just made it above 100 degrees in the typically hotter locations. But you look at the highs today and most of us just well into the 90s, which is fairly typical for this time of year. Currently still 102 in Catula, feeling the heat, that's for sure. 93 New Braunfels, 92 in Kerrville, 
Gonzales at 94 degrees and you look at the days ahead and our temperatures still be dropping a little bit. You're not going to really feel or notice much of a change. It's just that psychological change we will be going from 97 down to 94 by Friday. Gradually dropping, I should say by Saturday, we'll be down to 94 degrees. So generally in the mid 90s by the end of the work week and into the weekend. You look at the radar now, we had some of those pop up downpours, highly isolated, one of them even just east of Pleasanton now. And this activity is all dissipated, but we do have some outflow boundaries there. They're headed into Bear County now and parts of Guadalupe County and right along the Cibolo. That's where we're seeing that outflow boundary. So some of you will be getting a quick little burst of wind from that, a nice little cooling breeze from it. Big picture, we still have the big blue H, the upper level high planted over North Texas, so most of the activity is on the edges of it, especially in the Northland. That's good, they need the rainfall up there. They've got the serious drought going on up north, so they've been getting some rain with the high farther to the south. This, however, breaks down in the days ahead. That's gonna help open the door for just some of those random, brief, splash and dash showers in the afternoon hours, Thursday through the weekend and even into next week. Now, yes, early next week there is a wild card and that's the potential for a tropical system to emerge into the Gulf of Mexico. Still way too soon to even speculate about this. Right now we just have a cluster of rain and a few thunderstorms in the Caribbean. It hasn't even formed yet into any kind of organized system. So there's nothing to measure, which makes it nearly impossible to forecast. But we are expecting some organization over the next five days as this slowly drifts westward. This whole area from the Caribbean down into the Gulf of Mexico is where we could see some development. So let's fast forward, say, to Sunday. If this even emerges into the Gulf of Mexico as a system, it's still way too early to tell. Anything could happen. Literally anything could happen, including nothing. Yes, that's an option as well. And we may not even get an answer to this system until this upcoming weekend. OK, I know the meteorology, the science of it can't keep up with modern expectations. That's just the nature of meteorology, but we can't accurately predict a system that hasn't even formed yet. We can't measure it. It's just speculation right now. It's even too early to speculate if you ask me. Anyway, 77 tomorrow morning, 97 by the afternoon. A lot of sunshine tomorrow. And then we're looking at temperatures still near 100 south and west of San Antonio. Uh, downtown about 97 along with Lavernia. Timberwood Park 95 tomorrow and Castroville 98. There are those isolated rain chances every afternoon from Thursday through the weekend probably even lingering into next week. And of course, we're watching the tropics. Myra, I could go on for about a 45 minute uh, <laughs> diatribe here about modern expectations and how meteorology just can't. With the advent of the smartphone, it changed everything. Ah, didn't it though, in so many ways? No, it did. I've been in this business since I was 20 years old and I noticed when smartphones came along, everybody expected answers immediately and the precise answers Meteorology just isn't there yet. Yeah, I actually answers yesterday if you have those. We need a podcast. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. With the Pfizer vaccine now fully backed by the FDA, the race is on to vaccinate the nearly 82 million Americans who are eligible for the shot, but up until now haven't rolled up their sleeves. In local news, we have learned the name of a woman who died after crashing into a loading dock yesterday. Her name is Velia Alejandra Camarillo. She was 26 years old. San Antonio police believe that she may have been speeding when she crashed into the building on South Laredo near South Brazos yesterday morning. A West Side bar are filled with flames and a few surprises hours after it had closed for the night. It happened at the Reptiles Sports Bar. While firefighters were trying to put out the flames, they unexpectedly found someone inside. Facing pressure to extend the presence of U.S. troops in Afghanistan, the Biden administration is sticking with the August 31st withdrawal deadline. The plan is to end this mission on the 31st of August. I don't want to uh, suggest that that's not what we're planning on. 
The Pentagon points to an acceleration in evacuations from the Kabul airport, with 21,600 people evacuated in the past 24 hours. A fresh collaborative approach. That's what Kathy Hochul, New York's new female governor, says she's going to bring to the table. Hochul was sworn in this morning, nearly two weeks after Andrew Cuomo stepped down as governor. His resignation went into effect last night at midnight. Cuomo was facing impeachment after the New York State Attorney General released a report finding he sexually harassed 11 women. Cuomo, who served as governor of New York for 10 years, has denied all allegations. <laughs>A new episode and a brand new season of KSAT Explains debuts right after this newscast. Tonight's episode is all about the Texas foster care system and the fallout with family tapestry here in Bear County. We'll cover how the system is supposed to work, the ways in which it has failed, and what we can all do to help. We will live stream this episode at 7 o'clock in just a few minutes on the KSAT Facebook page, KSAT.com and the KSAT TV app. If you can't catch it live, we'll post the full episode later on this evening so you can watch it anytime on demand. Tomorrow we'll start the day in the 70s, then make it up to about 97 again for the high temperature. Of course, those of you closer to the Rio Grande and southwest of San Antonio back to triple digits, but we'll shave off a few degrees and add some isolated afternoon showers starting Thursday. All right, thanks, Adam. I'll see you online in a few minutes and right back here on the Night Beat at 10 o'clock. Have a good evening.